Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium podcast. This session is from the Big Screen Symposium held in Auckland on the 9th and 10th of July 2022. In this panel discussion, presented by the Aotearoa Screen Publicists Collective, publicist Courtney Mayhew and comedian Joe Damon dive into the importance of social media content and its role in helping your next project reach its audience. They discuss building a successful strategy, what you need to stand out, and how to do so while remaining authentic to your story and audience. This panel is moderated by Letterboxd Editor-in-Chief and Tangata Tiriti Chair of the Aotearoa Screen Publicists Collective, Gemma Gracewood. Enga mana, enga reo, enga karangatanga maha, then koutou, ko Gemma toku ingoa. I am the Tangata Tiriti Chair of the Aotearoa Screen Publicists Collective. You the slide. ASPC formed during COVID for a number of good reasons. Uh, we want our stories, our stories to be seen by their audiences. Uh, we want more audience specialists working in our industry, especially on stories with specific cultural needs. We want our media to pay more attention to our arts and not diminish the arts pages or minutes in their media products. And really importantly, publicists have often worked alone and uh, it's assumed in competition with each other, but in fact, we're all up in the WhatsApps sharing information about which arts editor has moved where and, and sharing contracts as well in Aotearoa and across oceans. So we're officially, as of this weekend, open for business. We're inviting new members and thanks to COVID recovery funding from New Zealand On Air and the Film Commission. We've got several initiatives underway, including a contact book that's going to be full of unit stills photographers and social media specialists and publicists and so on and so forth and other resources for producers. And we also have a very cool scheme, a one-off scheme that we've stolen the idea from uh, the music side of New Zealand on air for um, that I'll tell you more about at the end. We'll also have questions at the end, submit them via the app, but for now, let's meet our panel. And first of all, apologies from Kura Tura Whenua and Aaron Yap, who are both unable to be here today. And then I thought, well, if we're all here to learn about social media, let's get a social media virgin who's literally never been on social media, doesn't know anything about it. Um, so he can learn along with the rest of us. And so please meet Joe Damon. <laughs> Thanks for having me, everybody. Bulvanaka uh, Nadanga, Joe Damon, um, called Joe Damon Tokuingua. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first ever time speaking at a symposium, and I've never seen symposium so many times. So I saw my mates last night, and um, was just like, "What are you boys up to?" Uh, I'm speaking at a symposium. Um, <laughs> probably speak at the Beehive next year, um, <laughs> and then United Nations after that. But um, but now it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Got to thank Jim so much for, for having me, and uh, it's an honour to be here with Court as well, so thank you so much for having me. And cheers, yeah, cheers, I didn't have to pay for that ticket, it was... <laughs> From one of our industry's most experienced publicists who has worked both here and abroad, and we met at a WIFT event during COVID and went, oh my God, where have you been all my life? Please welcome Courtney Mayhew. Kia ora, thank you, thank you for that, Gemma. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Courtney Mayhew toko ingoa, uh, ko Ngāti Pākia ahau, he tangata tiriti, no Airangi o ko Tupuna. Um, I was originally born in Te Whanganui Atara and now reside here in Tamaki, Makoto. Um, I came back from overseas about four years ago. I have only ever worked in film since I was 18 and a cinema worker, and then started jumping into TV when I was jealous about all the fun you guys were having. Um, or the funding we were having. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get that, get that big bucks. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I've been really fortunate to work on international $250 million films down to the $20,000 ones, and I love New Zealand stories, and I'm stoked to be here in New Zealand and concentrating mainly in New Zealand now on stuff. I have been mainly working in communications, publicity, marketing, those sorts of things. In my company, we work in publicity, unit publicity on set, but we've also really expanded into doing content production behind the scenes and 
therefore into social media. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's a little bit of me. Here's, awesome. here's me making Sam Neill eat a burger live on BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing I do. There's a photo that Roseanne Liang took of me when I'm dressed like a teenage boy uh, <laughs> filming the Cremary Girls. Um, so, yeah, I've done a lot, of, a lot of little things and hopefully... And is that your best friend, John Boyega? That is, that is me being a stand-in for John Boyega because oh. I had a crazy idea to do a shoot up a mountain and I had to go up there and prove to the studio that it was a good idea first. So. Cool. Announce me. Uh... So I'm a producer and writer and currently have a day job as editor-in-chief of Letterboxd. Hands up or just say aye if you've got a Letterboxd. Aye. Yes. Aye. So I only have to explain it to half the room, which is awesome. It's a social network for film lovers. You can keep a diary of every film you watch. You can review those films. You can share those reviews with other people. It's made right here in Tamaki Makoto by a lovely bunch of chaps at Cactus Lab. And I came on board early as their part-time tweeter. Uh, so, as well as producing, publicity is something I've done my entire career. My first publicity job was for a... Michael Hurst was playing the widow Twanky in a watershed theatre pantomime sometime in the early 1990s. Sarah saw that. Yes! It was a sellout show. So, yeah, that gave me um, very false expectations for what the world of publicity was going to be like from then on. Um, and then in the late 90s, I was lucky enough to uh, in turn work under Sue May of Kiriata Publicity, who is our executive director of the um, Aotearoa Screen Publicist Collective. So I don't know why I did that. I think it's because I've always understood as a producer that we're just not just making things for shits and giggles, we're making things for people to see. And so I've always been interested in who, who those people are and how to reach them, and that's what brings me here today. The last few things I've made, aside from the day job, are with Joseph Hersher, who is a New Zealand YouTube star currently living in... London, and I know more about thumbnails than I ever thought it would be possible to know as a result of that experience. That's pretty exciting. I was born in Nainai in the shadow of the Avalon Tower, and I think that's what brings me here today. The BSS theme, as we've heard, is mana oaha, creative power. Joe and Courtney, I'd love, I've asked you to reflect on this. I'd love for you to tell me what creative power, mana oaha, means to you in the context of social media. All right, then. Um, I, for me, it's um, the, the, the ability and the, um, the bandwidth to expand on an already awesome story. So it's about being creative from the springboard of these amazing storytellers who have gone and made something, whether it's a TV show, it's a web series, or it's a film, and expanding their world and getting it out to uh, as broad an audience as possible in the most creative way we can. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> now, credit credit power to me, especially like the, you know, all of us we we work in an industry where it's a lot of stakeholders and a lot of different people. Stakeholders, that's a flash word. Eh? Mm. It's heaps of people, and um, I think one of the the biggest things that I've learned, creative power, to me, really represents is trust. Being able to trust like what everybody brings. I think for a long time, it sort of lent towards who was perceived to have the most experience. But, you know, in this day and age, we need experience that comes from all facets of culture and society and community. And so trust is probably the biggest thing that does it for me, yeah. I'm going to ask you to elaborate uh, a bit more on the, on the power of social media via a story about young, sexy and a T-shirt. That sounds real ominous for all of you. That... <laughs> So um, pretty, pretty much like the, my, my background was, was in social media and um, when I was about 20, I think I was about 22 at the time, and uh, I really wanted to be in television um, but really had no pathway. I hadn't formally trained or anything, just watched heaps of stuff and thought, yeah, mean, that looks, that looks all good. That was a direct quote. And um, <laughs> <laughs> what was happening at the time was there was this thing called P Comedy Pilot Week that I think TV3 were putting on. And um, it was all like the big production companies putting out a comedy show and then they were submitting it for the audience to then decide which one gets a full season. And I think out of that, Mean Mums and uh, Golden Boy, those were the ones that kind of came out of that. But as a newbie in the industry, I had no way of, you know, being involved in any of that. So me and a couple of my mates went and made a web series um, called This Is Auckland. And it was about these, these three guys all played by myself and their journey growing up in Auckland. And one of them was this rapper named Young Sexy, who's, 
a Māori dude from West Auckland. Young S-E-X. E- S-E-X-C, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spelt the West Auckland way. So uh, <laughs> basically what I'd figured out at that point was that social media was not only the best tool to connect to audiences, but it was the, it was the best way to kind of build a business around content in general. I think I'd seen the traditional model of like advertising, you know, and and getting your content sort of monetized through that lane. But I think that brought so many roadblocks, I guess, in the creative phase. And the creative phase is already difficult enough. And so I wanted to come up with a way that I could do it where we could make the content and still be able to make money. And so what I ended up doing was we did the web series and it, uh, it it really went well. And then what we rolled off the back of that was um, all these uh, basically vintage tees of one of the characters. And so what I did at the time was I, um, I put up uh, a post saying we're going to do a first drop of these vintage tees and they're only going to be up for a certain amount of time until we sell them out. And I only put up five tees, but I didn't tell anyone there was only five tees. And so when it sold out, and it sold out in like, you know, a couple of minutes because there's five of them. <laughs> And I'm related now, I've got five family members, so... Um, <laughs> so we sold the teas, and it sold out in like a minute, and then I put these big posts up like, we sold out in one minute all the teas, and then all these people were coming in like, yo, like, when can we get them? And so, I'm, and so I, I then posted another thing like, we're going to do a re-release tomorrow, only for 24 hours. And then in 24 hours, we sold uh, 40k worth of teas. And, uh, and that was the first instance where I really, you know, I, get, I guess this theory that I'd had, I put it into practice of if you really l- focus on the content first and you really focus on speaking to an actual audience that's there, all the money and the reward can come later. And, you know, that 40K, like, it was, it was a really good way for me to demonstrate that you can build a business, like, around doing content specifically focused at audiences. Mm. It's funny, I say it was good for a business. I just used that 40K for, like, um, my rent and that, but... <laughs> so. I thought you were going to give it back to your mum. For buying all the t-shirts. Yeah, no, no, she, you know, she, she, she got to be um, proud of. of all the, like, <laughs> mums, mums like that stuff. So. So what you're saying is, there's a creative power in audience. Yeah, for for sure. Yeah, which I also noticed this year with a with a show that is essentially of Aotearoa, but it's an HBO series. When I think about creative power, I think about the audience, and I think the audience can be the reason that your project meets its crowdfunding goal. The audience can be the reason that your series gets renewed. Who's seen Our Flag Means Death? Not many. When it came on HBO at the beginning of this year, at the same time as In Just Like That, HBO poured all of their marketing power into Sarah Jessica Parker, as you would. This show came on, rolled out week by week. I decided to watch it all the way through because I saw Pākehā Twitter going, oh, Reese Darby, he's so annoying. I'm never going to watch that show. And I went, unacceptable. That's a really, wow, big call. So I started watching it and was watching it as it dropped along with its building fandom and following these fans and seeing what they were doing as it was building. In came the fan art. Then came, here we go. So Samba is one of the um, cast characters. He started sharing orange cake recipes, which his character makes in the show, and then sharing photos of fans' orange cakes, which they would then cook and send to him. And so he would, yeah. Then he also started sharing all these beautiful behind-the-scenes photos he had taken and just writing the most gorgeous uh, captions about these people and really showing the humanity of the series. Then the fans started organising. They made a um, website for themselves. They created a card that was easy for people to sign and send into HBO, saying, renew the, se- renew the series. But more than that, as good fan groups do, they became activists and started fundraising for causes. The cause they chose to throw their weight behind was SAGE, which is an organisation for senior LGBTQ community members who need help. And the reason they chose that is because there's a really beautiful through line in Our Flag Means Death about ageing in the queer community. And um, they (laughs) raised a lot of money and they campaigned to renew the show alongside their fan art. After a long time, the news, renewal. 
and the excellent news that season two will shoot right here in Aotearoa. And also yesterday, the Hollywood Critics Association just nominated Reese and Taika for acting awards and Taika for directing the pilot episode. Taika's all over those awards, actually. So that's what I think of when I think of creative power. One thing to just quickly say, so this is a social media strategy session. It's mostly about using social media for publicity and marketing, but we are also acknowledging that social media is a platform in and of itself, as we know by the RFPs for TikTok-based series and so on. Um, so, Joe, I wanted to just throw to you and ask, um, I read in the spin-off, woo, spin-off, that West Park was built on a vision to produce social media-centric TV shows, but with television resources. Can you talk about this vision? Yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> now, one of, the, um, one of the biggest things with, um, with West Park, and I guess my personal, like, social media career, I suppose, <laughs> is the idea of user-generated content and engaging your audience to create the content for you. So it was something that I saw that's used heavily in social media, but then when I look at traditional media, uh, not only is it not utilised, I don't think a lot of people in traditional media understand the idea of, again, turning to your audience to create the content for you. So, for example, like, I'll give an example. I promise it's not humble bragging, but um, I was on Celebrity Treasure Island, and... Um, <laughs> And I, I promise this is related. I didn't just want to drop my um, IMDb. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I knew, I kind of knew because I'm like a social media creator that a lot of uh, older generation wouldn't know who I was. So I knew there'd be heaps of like, who the, who the hell is this guy? And so I got my audience to um, start posting on um, all the different like social media pages that were posting about the show and post that I was a celebrity chef. And then all I was doing was just reposting everybody's versions of like my audience engaging with all these people, telling them that I'm a celebrity chef. And so it was them creating content for me. And then all I was becoming was a distribution platform for the content that they were creating. Mm. And uh, I think overnight, like just from that, it was another five, 5,000, just another 5,000 followers. Just, <laughs> just a normal night. But... Um, <laughs> But us at West Park, that's, that's something that we're really um, hitting home with a lot of the, the people that we work with is creating content that is specifically for generating user-generated content. And exactly like what Jim mentioned, creating fandom around the content and really incentivizing people to create it for you. And because that's what organic word of mouth on social media looks like, is people basically telling that story for you. And when it comes to a social media strategy, your audience is going to be able to tell the story better to their mates than you ever could. So incentivize them to do that. It comes back to that thing of trust. You've just got to trust that they're going to tell that story. Because all I did was tell my audience, hey, tell everybody that asked that I'm a celebrity chef. And there was people posting like, yeah, he trained in Prague. Um, <laughs> I've never been to Prague. <laughs> Where's that, by Blenheim? I was... Um, <laughs> And, you know, they really took a hold of that and, and they told that story better than I ever could. And it just, uh, it just became an easier job for me because all I was doing was just screenshotting, posting up. And it's not only the, the best way to do, to do content and the, the most engaging, but it's also the easiest. So, <laughs> so we're kind of building it around that, yeah. So in order to get your audience to do the job for you, you have to give them something to do that job with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take it back to basics. I want to read a provocation from a producer that led to this session being formed. Our social media deliverables have increased with each project. We're expected to learn how to do it ourselves. How do we find and how do we work together with social media content creators? And then there's the technical stuff. TikTok is vertical, Facebook is horizontal. They want you to create an Instagram or a Facebook page, but you can't until the film or show is publicly released. It's a real skill which takes time and resources for all the different platforms. There's a lot in there. Courtney Mayhew, your time is now. <laughs> Talk us through deliverables and how to deliver them. From that first bit, don't do it yourself. That's the, that's the answer to it. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you guys will see from the things that me and Joe and Gemma talk about, it takes us so much work. Your deliverables are your, are your core marketing assets that are going to take you 
through all of, of the release of whatever you're doing. So your stills, your behind the scenes footage, your EPK sit down interviews, yes, but also your off the cuff selfie videos. There are many ways to, to gather these things, but the key thing is to have a plan and to start as early as humanly possible. Sometimes when you come to us really late, we can do it, we can figure it out. Um, I've had to do that a lot. But I have come up with much better materials the earlier someone has had a chat to me and the earlier I've been able to read that script, sit down with the filmmakers and not just the producer, but the director and make sure everyone's on board and that everyone's aware of how important this is. Everyone's aware that in gathering these deliverables and gathering these assets, we're not going to impede on your show. We want it to work. And that's what we're there to do. What is the point? I think the way that you and I met was I stood up at a WIFT event, probably after a few margaritas, mm. and I said, what's the point of making something unless someone's going to see it? Um, and I was like, best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's your, that's your core deliverables. Is yeah. There, yeah. So the photos, the gallery stills that you take with your key talent and then the photos that you take while you're making the show. Joe, you also, I was stalking your Instagram and you seem to have someone filming you a lot while you're filming your shows. Who is that person? How much do they cost? And why did you make that choice? Yeah, so, so we've got a specific uh, head of in-house content, um, Martin Barmani, and that's his full-time job is just in-house internal content behind the scenes. I'm going to give you an analogy. You guys like analogies? Woo! Do we like analogies? Yes. They're usually either real mean or real stink, so just, just stay with me. So yeah. social media, a lot of people think of it as an art gallery where everyone kind of gets their turn to have their thing seen. And that's sort of the approach that a lot of people take is that if I just chuck it up, someone's going to walk past and have a look. But it's not an art gallery. It's actually a highway. And it's a highway where everyone's moving way past the speed limit. The way you've got to think about it is, if it's a highway, you've really got to give people a massive reason to stop. But what's the best way to get someone to stop? Is it to just have one stop sign once? Or is it to have those big, like, you guys know when you're driving on Auckland Motorway and there's those big, like, trucks with the X on the back? You know, put like 12 of them, maybe some road cones, maybe a couple of dudes like in high vis lollipop. You know, you're putting as many things on the highway, that's more likely to get people to stop than just one thing that says stop. And so that's what the approach with in-house content is, is if you're constantly reminding people what you're up to, it doesn't have to be related to the show, but you're just putting in those little road cones, you know, those big trucks with the X. The longer you do that and the more you do that, the more you're incentivizing them to stop. Mm. And uh, that's what I'm saying is, yeah, stop on highways. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take, take, take that away from that whole analogy, please. <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, how was that analogy? I saw a few hands. Cool. Um, yes, here we go. So when it comes to stills, stills, photographs, you've all come from Kirsty Griffin's session, so you're completely primed for this. This is a one, like, maybe ten-second version of what Kirsty said. The kinds of stills that we use on Letterboxd social media and that film accounts generally... Uh, love using on social media are not the kinds of unit production stills that, unit, that productions generally book the stills photographer for. We're not interested in the explosion. We're interested in the guy knitting on the set of Mad Max. We're interested in, um, you know, memories of a murder, just like having a nice time in the street rather than actually being a thing about murder. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Thomason just looking cute with Anya. We're just really interested in the human moment. We're interested in Spider-Man wearing track pants over his Spider-Man costume. You see these kinds of photos. These are the ones that make you stop in your tracks and look at the humans behind production differently and create memes around it and so on and so forth. But how do you get that stuff at court? Yeah, so one of the things that I, every time I see these and I know from working on the big studio films, we have a photographer on set every single day and they develop a rapport. You do not get a photo of Nicholas Holt. He's a lovely guy. I have worked with him. But you don't get a photo of him knitting if you've just walked onto the set and he doesn't know who you are. When I first started doing unit publicity, the explosions was what we used to plan for if we didn't have enough days on set. But now they are sometimes when I go, okay, they're going to have some downtime 
oh, that's going to be, they're, they're going to be sitting together, those two people. You kind of, you're also planning for what's going to be happening behind the scenes. And it's really difficult for someone to walk in cold. It's kind of unfair to your still photographer to get magic like that. I mean, I kind of liken it to, to your actual shoot. You don't do one take and hope that you've got it. You do many, many takes to make sure you've got it. And so anything you do, any asset gathering, the more time that can be spent doing it, the more gold you're going to have in the end. And that's the same as having Marty in-house. Yeah. And what? having that rapport, right, with your crew and cast. For, for sure. Because one of the big things we, we really emphasise with Marty, uh, that, that he himself really focuses on, is when it comes to building, like, behind-the-scenes content and content that's really going to translate is... Like Jim mentioned, the I guess the, the frame of thinking beforehand was, what's the moment that we have to capture? What are the moments? But actually, what, what translates on social media is the reaction. People want to see, like, themselves. Mm. And so no longer does the explosion, that doesn't translate if you, if you want a, that to connect with an audience online. What would translate is the PA watching the explosion just being like, oh, fuck, that's... <laughs> That's fucking heaps of fire. Like, yeah, I, that, that, I did a, I did a whole want. series once on a hilarious PA yeah. on, a, on a Australian TV show because I was like, "You are a classic." Can yeah. I film you? Yeah. <laughs> Went off. Yeah. Yeah, because he was just his reactions to whatever oh was going God. on was way better, and you'd see really famous actors walking behind him, <laughs> and that just made it funnier than that actor being really stilted oh, and talking to camera. What about the one but, where it's Stephen Yun and everyone's just coming up? Yeah, and giving them a kiss him. on the cheek. Oh, that's but the, the other way that you can do it is I've done this and had a, had a social media phone, which I've given to cast and then particular crew, and I'm like, this is the social media phone, especially on big projects where you don't want them taking it on their own phones, and pass it around to them on certain days. And because so many young people, especially young cast, are used to filming themselves, they're way more comfortable than if mm. I chuck a camera in their face. So they're going to be more authentic and you're going to get better stuff, and then they give me the phone at the end of the day. And they can delete stuff as well. It gives them control. So, you know, if they're not comfortable with something, then they're not going to give it, hand it over to me. Mm. For so, sure. Yeah. For sure. That stuff's amazing. What about when you want all of the key, key people involved who are on the top of an icy mountain, having been helicoptered in, and your time is limited, and you're asking them to spend time on something that is not the minutes for the film. The film, yeah. Let's have a look at this. Right now. Thank you. Welcome to Sikaric Mouth City. No, my best friend is who lives in Duba. Oh, no, no. Proud to see Yeah, Jackie. I'll be sure of a honey last year. I'm going to do Duska. Proud to see you. Duska? Yeah, Duska. For those who get to Sikaric Terry, so to do Duska. Yeah, the 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 Duska. He went to the fair and bought it. And I could sit the book. And I could hit in the food with your fist. New Tuesday is in cinemas now. Yes, it is. Please go see it. Court was there. Uh, I was so I was very lucky to work with the team on set um, for New Tuesday, and. Everything that I talk about today, there is always a massive team doing it with me in some way, shape, or form. And this one, I was on set and um, helping gather the things, but Mad Men have done the release and, of the social media ass assets and the editing together. Um, but I was there with the filmmakers, and one of the great things that, um, shout out to producer Emma did, Emma Slade, was made sure before they even started filming that everyone was on board, that this was going to be happening, and we had a whole bunch of brainstorms about things that we were going to capture. One of the concepts we came up with is mockumentary-style filming. It's in gibberish. It means that we can, you know, put the... <laughs> in gibberish? I still can't get over that. <laughs> we can put the uh, subtitles on later, and um, then we can just see what gold transpires from that. But I think probably what's key about that is we have so, so much footage of this. We have so much gibberish behind the scenes. And that, I, spoke, I asked Mad Men before this panel, that was the most popular clip. 
They think it's because, one, it was a key moment in the film, him in the ice pool. We've got our key biggest character, like most well-known, Jermaine and Jackie. It's behind the scenes with the director. People love behind the scenes, and it's only a minute. We had a really great two-and-a-half-minute clip, which um, I thought was hilarious that they had edited together, but you could see the, dr the, the views drop off after one minute. People just don't watch those things. So every time someone comes to me and they're like, yeah, yeah, we had an EPK crew, yeah, yeah, can you just do the social media? Here's a four-and-a-half-minute clip. Yeah. It's, it's un really unfortunate. I totally get it. If you want to make it work, short and sweet and funny, if it's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not if it's a drama. Yeah. We'll come to we'll that. Come to that yeah. We'll come to that, yeah. We'll come to that. We will talk a bit about comedy versus drama. And by the way, I just want to encourage uh, anyone still involved in the Nude Tuesday marketing team to just jump on Letterboxd and look at the four- and five-star reviews that are a variation on one theme, which is congratulations to all Jermaine Clement fans. Um, and just extract those reviews and share them across social media and get all the rest of the Jermaine Clement mm. fans. It's obviously the... Reason is in the title, and that's all I'll say about that. But it just is exciting to people who love Jermaine. How deliverables can be used on social to introduce character. <coughs> this is from Kura Tura Whenua's work on Kid Sister, the Greenstone series that is now on TVNZ. So Kura worked um, with Tamar, mentoring her to introduce the show, the tone of the show, the style of the comedy, the characters, Simone Nathan, who's the creator and the lead actress, using the unit assets to then introduce character and give you an idea of what it is you're going to see. You can also use those assets that you captured on set to be in conversation with the culture as it's happening. Do you want to tell us about this one, Court? We, we got a lot of assets on Panthers, which was really fantastic because it meant that for things that were going on in the conversation, we were able to insert ourselves. There was always this still of Demetrius that um, we wanted to use, and the day that Chris Hipkins said, go out and spread your legs, was the day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is August 24th, so this is exactly a week into the... Terrible 2021 lockdown. That and, it's, and it was literally, from. it was, you know, a half an hour after it had happened. We, again, with the Panthers, there was a huge team behind it, Tavake, the production company. You know, that, I, I looked back on my WhatsApp and it was us all throwing captions out there and saying, what should we say? And then I said that and it, all it is is just crying laugh emojis. And I went, okay, working. Yeah. Um, it also... Oh, yeah, because your crew, your, your team in the Slack channel or the WhatsApp yeah. are your first audience. Yeah, exactly. If it's working there. And we were very different, like, we all came from different perspectives. And one of my perspectives was I was pretty sure Palangi woman 40 plus, there was an audience there. This picture confirmed that. <laughs> Lynn Freeman, RNZ, first to like it. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And yeah. so this is what you do when you have a drama yeah. and you're wondering what to do on social media. This is one of the things that one you can the, do. Yeah. There, are, there is more and we will come to that. Sometimes, and it's not advisable, and we hope that after this session it will never happen again, a publicist is brought on to a production mid-season or towards the end. There's something in the word deliverables, I think, that implies the end. Hopefully, as part of this kind of what we're driving home today is it's right at the start. Your audience need to be in your mind right at the start. But what does happen when you come to something mid-season? What do you do when you haven't been on set during shoot to gather content? You trawl through as many of the assets as humanly possible. Everything that's on here was stuff that was on set. The bloopers video, which is still one of the most popular things on the Wellington Paranormal things, was, that, it was the main unit camera. And Paul Yates just kind of said to me, oh, actually, I think we've got bloopers from season one. And I was like, please, give it to me. And we had just people going crying out for bloopers after that um, particular clip. But everything that's on here were things that we reappropriated, we figured out um, when needed. Um, the reason that uh, Paul came to me was that they had sold overseas and uh, they couldn't service the hunger of the overseas audience. Uh, oh, can I just stop you there? Yeah. We didn't plan this ahead of time. Yes. Something that often is a source of tension here is the deliverables that the local platform or the local network are asking you to supply often being different and a lot less than if you then happen to have the enormous luck and hard work of selling overseas. 
and then the deliverables overseas, requested by overseas are a lot this more. big. And so we, we often find ourselves in a, yeah, at a point of tension where we've checked the contract, the local contract, and gone, oh, yep, that's all we have to do. And or then, you've had the experience of it not being used, so you think that it's not going to be necessary. Uh, yeah. So you could have delivered it and it wasn't used. And so you go, oh, well, I'm not going to need that next time. And the fact is, you do. We, uh, you know, I think it was for, a, this is a film, not a series, but the last film I worked on, which was Netflix, sold to Netflix, needed 250 approved stills. And those, and this is when Netflix even have their own, they've got this program that goes through and takes screenshots. They know that they still need stills by a stills photographer. So those, uh, I think everyone's got to think about, look at best, best practice overseas. Think about where you want your series to go. If you are in season one and you want to go to season four, you've got to start building your audience now um, and you have, to, you have to make time and you have to not call me on a Friday when it's launching on the Monday. <laughs> but... That's one hundred percent happened, okay. and I have spent the whole weekend with my with with myself editing and my editor editing and changing things because I want it to do well. Yeah, but I I can hear Tamar going, "Yep, yep." <laughs> what What was great with both Jermaine and Paul with this is Jermaine said, "Like Jermaine's got this amazing personal persona on Twitter, so you would think he can do it." on the page, and he was like, oh, I just don't know how to do Twitter as Wellington Paranormal. He couldn't remove himself. He was too close to the project, and which totally made sense. So when it was a fan, myself, and also um, an editor who I was working with, also a fan, we basically came up with a plan for every single episode. There was a certain amount of assets we would have for each, and then we would come up with, like, sort of one kooky thing. So, like, that Wellington Paranormal parental advisory looks like a rap album thing. <laughs> I put that on Twitter pretending we hadn't done it and just said, who did this? And it went off. <laughs> um, but the, the um, art department, the, the posters in the background, I was like, those posters are epic. Let's try and get some of those out there. So just anything, your, any assets, anything that's happening, keep them. Because there are so many things that Paul couldn't find that would have been amazing for us to use. And um, yeah, they were overseas, used them. SBS were amazing. HBO were amazing. And the thing is as well, they started, they didn't necessarily always put it on natively themselves, but if we did it, they would retweet, they would repost. So that was, yeah, it was good. It's just like a, a big, big suite of assets. And I think as well, when you've got a comedy, I would pick each episode, I would go, I think this is the one, the, the line that the, that the audience are going to respond to and I'm going to make sure I've got an asset ready for that. I'd be right 70% of the time. So I'd leave a bit of bandwidth, a bit of time and resource at our end to once the episode had aired, if we got it wrong and there was another line that had resonated and everyone was talking about it, we could quickly create that and get it out immediately. Interesting. So you're, so you're talking about having somebody on social media across the season, yeah. not just for the launch. No, mm. Mm, definitely. Mm. People are late to the party now. People know with streaming, it's going to be on there for a while. Yeah. So why do I have an urgency to see it? And so you need to keep the conversation going. I was going to ask you this at the end. Um, what are some of your favourite tools you use in the social media space? I'm going to ask it now specifically because of what we're looking at. <laughs> yeah. Giphy. Giphy. Who uses Giphy? Not enough is the answer. Giphy is, Why should we use Giphy? Giphy is such a great tool. It's a, basically, it is a social media platform yeah, where you can get yourself authenticated pretty easy and it natively pulls through to both Twitter and to Instagram. So on Instagram, it's stickers. So we made that little ghost sticker because people love that ghost. So if you search hashtag Wellington Paranormal or hashtag Wally Paranormal, you'll see that and a bunch of other stickers that we made on Instagram on stories. Twitter as well, GIFs. We could just, you just upload a video and it turns it into a GIF yourself. So, GIFy. Yeah. Secret weapon. Does, does New Zealand on air have any Instagram stickers through GIFy? Amy's looking elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, me up. Just, <laughs> was just thinking that, you know, the logo spinning when you're posting about your show could be quite good. Same with the Film Commission. I don't know, like <laughs> yeah. lead from the top. Uh, yep. Um, having said that, I asked Aaron, yeah, the same question this week. I was like, does Letterbox actually have any Instagram stickers? And he was like, I'll go and do that. <laughs> so, yeah, fair call, calling us all out. Clips. We need to talk about, so the other thing is whether you're coming to the job late or whether you're, you know, just folding it into your, your mahi all the way through. The power of the clip. The power of the clip. Here is a clip from Kid's sister. Oh, what? 
is this? It's like a medley of rabbis. People on their lunch breaks like it. Okay? I'm not catering this place to Jews. Jews don't even come here. They do not want to see other Jews. Nor do I, Beck. Nor do I. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. Just, again, giving you a beautiful insight into the tone, the characters, and also specific anniversary post. Social calendar is a great thing to have. Just plot out the year. Christmas. Birthdays, your cast birthdays. Yeah, cast birthdays, Christmas, your character birthdays, whatever it is. Plot out the year and put all the significant stuff in and make some plans for posts around that. Sometimes, though, it's quite tricky to... This is going to be the fun, kind of rattle the cage part of the session, I reckon. Quite tricky talking with your platform or network partner about clips and about what they will and won't let you put on your social channels for um, reasons that seem to be to do with not wanting to give the story away and not wanting people to just watch that one clip on Instagram and not come to the platform to watch the show. Um, and other reasons I personally don't understand. And is one of the reasons I got involved in the Screen Publicists Collective in the first place was from a fairly frustrating network conversation about how to release clips from What's Your Problem, which is a series I made with Joseph Hersher for YouTube and for Hey Hey. The series involved us asking Kiwi kids for their most annoying problems and then building absolutely ridiculous machines to solve those problems. One of the problems was a kid whose mum was always asking him to clean up the Lego in his room. We solved his problem by um, building a, a cut-out shape of the floor that goes around the furniture, and he gets in bed at night and he winds a lever that lifts the entire floor of his room up and then tips and pours all of the Lego and toys into a basket in the corner. And then as it comes back down, it drops the curtain and turns the light off. The network were not keen on us showing any machines on our social media because that would give away the episode. The machines are what have made Joseph famous and able to live off his own means. The machines are what excite the children and the machines are what bring them to the show. And children are repeat viewers. Like they're totally repeat offenders with an episode they love. We were confident in that and we had come with our YouTube experience and we knew it was going to work. But the conversation with the network and by the way, we'd also built in, and this is part of strategy, building in edit time that is unrelated to making the main show. So building an edit time at the end to make all of these social assets is so important. We'd built in two weeks and another editor in order to create a whole bunch of social assets around the show. And when we showed the drafts to the network, it was very clear that there was too much machine in those videos. So the only one we got onto our social networks was an outtake that I'd filmed on my phone of Joseph demonstrating the machine to the kid and then the kid's reaction. So it was a beautiful machine reaction video and we chucked it up and we got 200,000 views within that first weekend and we were able to justify it by saying it wasn't the real footage, it was an outtake, which frustrates me to this day. Um, Hey, Joe, ever had an experience like that? No, nah, never. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's one thing that uh, I think a, a lot of networks, they sort of see the content it's as an asset, and every time we put that asset out there, it has to get the return from it that we can measure, that validates what we've put into it. And so it's always a really hard conversation because when it comes to social media, it's a lot of, like, you've just got to let it go. You've got to let it go and you've got to let people decide what it means to them because that's how you'll actually get them to draw, to draw in. And so one of the big approaches that we take with content is like we'll use our clips, but the clip isn't inherently related to the show itself. So like for, for example, if I was like given a 20-second clip of like a really dramatic show and uh, somebody said to me, put this out there in the best way that you think would translate on social media. I think a lot of networks would think you put the whole clip out there with all the context so they understand all the dramatic beats, they understand the character's intention. People on social media, they don't give a shit. Like, 
they, they, you'll never get them to care as much as you care. And I know that's real, like, blunt, um, but you, you really won't. And so the best way I would approach it with this really dramatic scene is I would cut up if it's, you know, if it's a person. Who's seen Handmaid's Tale? Yeah, see, a few, <laughs> few hands there. So you, do you remember at the end of every episode, it would finish and she's like, she looks like that? You, you know, so every episode would end and she's, like, looking real, like, ominous. So I, I wouldn't put any context as to why she's looking like that. How I would do it is I would just get the picture and then put a caption like, when mum says you can't get chips at the supermarket, you know? Like, <laughs> immediately relatable, immediately people understand at least some form of whatever this piece of content is. It may not be what you think it is with their understanding of it, but it's enough that they're now interested. They're going to go and figure it out. Mm. And so that's how we approach with clips is... Um, the clip that we've got is from one of the shows we did with Māori TV. And the clip itself is, you know, that doesn't really give any context to what the show is. But we just put a little caption on there. And then for everybody who's interacting with it, if it's the only thing that they see, at least it's something that they themselves can define in their own way. And if they then decide to go and engage with the content, then they can do that. And so with this one, it's, it's pretty ominous. And we've chucked it up on TikTok and... I think it got a quarter of a million views. Let's have a look at it. Oh, 18 plus. There might, oh. be, might be some G-strings down here. <laughs> you know what 18 plus means, eh? What? That means oh, size sorry. 18 <laughs> plus. <laughs> oh, 18 plus. You know, might, oh. might be some G-strings down here. <laughs> uh, you know what time. 18 plus means, eh? What? That means oh, size sorry. 18 plus. <laughs> Thank oh, you. So we, we didn't put any info on the show or at all. There's, there's literally nothing telling you like where you can watch that <laughs> at all. <laughs> but that, that, that generated so much interest that, you know, people saw that clip and they were like, okay, where do I find this? So how do I get there? And you're incentivizing them to create their own journey of it. So by the time they get there, they're way more engaged because they've gone on that journey themselves. If you give them everything at the start, they're just going to be like, oh, well, all the info's there. I don't even need to go. But if you just kind of drip feed it... Tease them. Mm. And so did you just them. drop that? Yeah, we just chucked that out. Without talking to the yeah. Ata Māori? Yeah, yeah, didn't talk to anyone. Just... And was it OK? I think after they saw the views, they were pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they're, yeah. they're pretty good. I, I think with, with most places, they just, you know, they don't really have that confidence in social media yet. So little Fine. things like that, you know, when you say you've just got to chuck it up, and even like Court and I were talking beforehand, one big thing on social media is you've got to think, when people are scrolling, what are they going to be seeing predominantly? It's like pictures with their mates. But the second they see something that's like really professional, well lit, they know they're being sold something. So if you really want to post content that's going to connect, your pictures, they actually kind of have to look like shitty. Because yeah. <laughs> they've got to blend in and, and that's going to beat that internal sort of filter that this generation has created when it comes to being advertised on social media. Mm. And so that, that's like one of the really big things as well that you've got to focus on is... because Shitty. It, yeah. <laughs> trust me, make, make it look shitty. But so when, when you tell network stuff like this, they're like, oh, no, nah, we want something really well lit in a studio. They don't realise that a selfie with like, you, you know, and, the cleaner, that's probably actually going to do way better. And to a certain audience as well, like for the Panthers, for example, we made content for TVNZ for their TV1 Facebook that we didn't put on any of the Panthers' social channels. Yeah. You know, that were ones that were uh, like uh, behind the scenes about the character of Robert Muldoon. Yeah. You know, because the TV1 Facebook audience were interested in that. Our audience that had been, you know, curated were not. So, and to the, the point of that, the Panthers... Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you're talking about making things look shitty. Yeah, this is not. This is not. Yeah. And don't make it look shitty. And this is a, essentially a short section on the trailer drop on social media. And when you do make something that looks absolutely incredible, yeah, I tell just, us about this. Yeah, I, I just really believe that the first thing you put out there, and especially the first AV thing, is going to really define, it's like a first look image as well, it can really define the tone of your show. And it's really hard for you to get away from that if you've done it the wrong way. The Panthers, they put so much effort into this trailer and, and money. Um, and it's awesome. The trailer was amazing. It served the audience. It, it, it was something that people hadn't seen before. And when we, we actually, TVNZ dropped it a couple of days after us, but we went with it first. And one, it was really good to see where our audience was. We all had an inkling it was Instagram. Um, Resource-wise, we didn't have enough people 
to go across, to, to, to really be catering to all the different social media platforms. So we thought it would be Instagram, but we dropped it on Twitter, Instagram, and um, Facebook. If it was today, I would have done it on, this was a year ago, but if it was today, I would have done it on um, TikTok as well. But Instagram was where we got the most of our views, which was over half a million. Um, and the sh- is it good for a New Zealand production? It is pretty good. I, I think it's, yeah, like it was, we were almost at a mill when you put all of them together, like all of, you know, YouTube <laughs> just everywhere. It was insane. It went, really did go game busters. And Joe, do you, it, did this come across your socials? Yeah, it did, yeah. And when you hear a million New Zealand, that's, that's crazy. It's like the whole of South Island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that's heaps of people. I've been to Queenstown. That's heaps. That's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was a brag game. <laughs> Who's been to Queenstown? Uh, Kura was, if she were here, uh, yeah. was saying uh, the feeling when this came across her socials was a feeling of being served, not so, served in a tennis sense, but served to. For sure. Uh, and of the story being in service of a very specific audience who hadn't necessarily been served something so good looking and so powerful. Mm. And I loved hearing that. I wish she were with us today, but she's not. We've got Joe, but that's all right. You're learning a lot. Um, as we said before, your audience will find the comedy in drama. Let's have a look at how something as full on as Panthers can be turned into comedy. You're staying, you're staying, you're gone. Sorry. Wasn't sure about you, um, but I'm going to tip towards gone. So, gone. One of you two has been rejected. Who do you think it is? <laughs> Wrong. It's you. You're in. You're rejected. You're staying. You're staying. You're gone. Sorry. <laughs> Wasn't sure about you, um, but I'm going to tip towards gone. So, <laughs> one of you two has been rejected. I love this. Who do you think it is? So we've um, that, how we've, many views did that get? Oh, Two hundred and something. Something ridiculous. A thousand. And also, she's pulled those stills from our social media. <laughs> So that's the other thing, shareable <laughs> assets. You know, like she's taken that and turned, yeah, I love that so much. So because I'm uh, an old lady, um, I say that because the media yesterday called some 52, I'm not 52, but called some 52-year-old woman an elderly woman. Um, that oh, was cool. <laughs> Didn't feel attacked at all. Um, but because I am an old lady and because we just watched a TikTok, Let's take a sidebar to talk for a while about TikTok, the behemoth, the little social media that could, that's just come roaring up straight past Facebook, straight past Instagram. At Letterboxd, we jumped on TikTok only a few months ago and only because our audience, our members, were using TikTok to talk about us in a specifically awesome way. They were using it to talk about our features and how our members can use them. They were, they were doing our marketing work for us. It was amazing. Since then, since jumping on board, the creative team at TikTok reached out to us directly and have so far had two meetings with our social team purely to talk about how to use it better. That's all. They've been amazing. Um, and the things that Aaron said he's learned the most from them is unlearning. You have to break your brain in terms of what you know and understand about social media so far. And you have to f- sort of follow your audience But interestingly, in a social media world where brands are often seen as, okay, brand, thanks for telling me what I think on Twitter and Instagram, brands or shows or films can be really successful at starting prompts and the like on TikTok. And so I guess, um, Joe, you don't know a lot about TikTok, but can you tell us the little that you do know, like how long you've been on it and how often you post one question here is how often is too often, generally speaking, for social media, but go for it. No, the, the lifespan on social media is it's two-second memory, which is both good and bad. It's bad in the sense that, that there's not a lot of time that people will pay to what you, you've put together. There's not a lot of time that they're going to remember what it is. And so that's why the thought process of you've got to do something that's easy to repeat and really simple because people are just forgetting it straight away. And so they're actually, I'm gonna say, there there isn't posting too often. There really isn't. My my biggest period of growth uh, on social media, I think I went from, on TikTok, from uh, zero to 50K over six weeks. 
post it every single day and some days twice twice a day. And even that's like not too much. That's not considered too much. So yeah, there's never there's never too much. I'm gonna give another analogy. <laughs> so you've got to you've got to think about social media this way. So let's say there's two houses. One house, there's a real mean party going on, and then the other house is pretty chill, like they're just hanging out. The chill house, they have made the best pies like ever in history. There have never been any pies better than what this house has. But there's no one at that house. The other house, that party's rocking. They just got the pies from Countdown. But everyone's eating those pies. So what I'm trying to say is... <laughs> a lot of you are at the house, the empty house with the mean pies, waiting for people to come over to your house to try them. But they're happy at the party with the stink pies. <laughs> so you put in all the effort to make the mean-ass pies, but they're eating stink ones over there. So the change the effort from trying to draw people over to your house with your mean-ass pies, your effort now has to be going to that party. And even better, you're coming to that party with mean-ass pies. Mm. It's just going to take it to another level. I didn't finish. I didn't really get to, like, figuring out what was going to happen at the end of that analogy. <laughs> Maddie, but, you're behind the scenes guy, take, is at the mean party. He's at the mean party. And but, he's filming the good pies. Yeah. So we've got the mean party with the mean pies. <laughs> he's copying so, yeah, pies. That's the, like, I'll end it there. <laughs> okay. Cool. You know the message. On a scale of one to a People thousand, how stink. was that analogy? People are eating stink pies okay. over yeah. mean pies. Awesome. Was that, that one was all good. That's amazing. Thank you. Next year, 2023 Big Screen Symposium, Joe Damon's analogy session. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Incredible. I'll be um, there all day. How do you get on the FYP, the For You page? Have I'm going to bring, bring, bring it back to the pies. Have you been on the FYP? A couple Pro times. Oh. So what the For You page is, the, the For You page is basically like an amalgamation of all the like trending uh, content, the stuff that everybody's really liking. And the For You page on TikTok is actually a really powerful tool because it's literally TikTok telling you what's popular and what you need to be doing. Mm. And why TikTok is a really good platform is because they're really incentivizing people that follow what's going well on the For You page. So like what that video that we saw before with the Panthers thing, that sound that she was using at the time was trending on the For You page. And as you saw with the content, it's crack up as, but it's not, it's nothing that would have taken a ridiculous amount of time. You know, it wasn't like this mean as like well-baked pie. It was just like a cheeky little savory. But that was perfect for everyone at the pie. I'm still staying on this. And <laughs> I might talk like this for the rest of my life. <laughs> but that was perfect for everybody that needed it. That was perfect for everybody that needed it. Mm. And then kind of bringing back what I said before, it told the story better than they could have told it themselves to her audience. So I keep like, losing my train of thought because I fine. keep thinking about yeah. the pie. One thing I wanted to say, <laughs> looking at your TikTok, what I notice is cheap location, yeah. your car, a location that you could use throughout it's COVID. It's actually real lockdowns. flash, but... Um... <laughs> Sorry. Really simple format, re yeah. easily repeatable. Yeah, I'm and wearing the same clothes even. And volume. Different, different days. Volume. Um, yeah. How often do you post? Yeah, so I was posting every day then. And as I, as I mentioned before, I just found a formula that was really easy to repeat. Me sitting in my car, just talking about random shit. And um, it wasn't, you know, those weren't necessarily the videos that like popped off. But they were the ones that were going well enough that I could just stay consistent and build an audience over time. And then when I had one that was really, really good, that stuck out amongst all of them. And so I guess to speak to Court with the Panthers trailer, you know, if you're constantly putting up really like well put together content like that trailer was, your audience is gonna keep expecting that. Yeah. And so you have that pressure of constantly doing that. But if you're drip feeding them like really easy to consume, really simple content, and then in the middle of that you drop that trailer, you've already got that audience that you built up over that time of drip feeding content, mm. and then you've just times it by 10 with this really extravagant piece of content that you then can go back to what your audience has become accustomed to, which is sitting in your car talking about like, your nan and stuff, which is um, what some of those videos are about. My nan, not, not your nan. I don't know your nan. Um. Um, I want to talk about voice a bit. Um, especially, so Joe, you talk in your own voice 
But when you're talking on behalf of a show or a film or a documentary or indeed New Zealand On Air or, you know, flicks, how do you work to build a voice that other people may also be speaking in? Um, on Letterbox, this is the kind of voice we use. We know movies, we're a bit silly, and we're kind, actually. We're very focused on not sort of punching down at all as a brand. Lionsgate, if you don't follow them on TikTok, absolutely follow them. They are out the gate insane TikTokers, taking Twilight footage and rolling it in with Stranger Things footage and taking the piss out of Nick Cage and in ways that are just so beautiful. And then you've got Wellington Paranormal, which you come to with, so Paul Yates readily admits he only knows Facebook. He's an old man, just knows Facebook. Jermaine, obviously an amazing tweeter in his own voice. But when you're trying to create the voice of a show, how do you do that, Court? You hire me. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry, Mike, for the two shirtless pics. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's weird. It just, it, it's hard to say because you just kind of have to distance yourself and find someone who can figure out. Because like that, that um, wow is not funny if it's from myself. It's funny because Wellington Paranormal saying it. So it's, you have to put your mind into the brand almost and say what makes us funny, especially with Wellington Paranormal, we can talk, we can kind of lean into the, like the we won weird, it was for comedy and not a documentary, but we won. Like we often talk about the fact that it's a documentary and if someone says something to us that was a really funny scene, how did you put that together? I'm like, what do you mean scene? It just happened, it's a documentary. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of that. So it's, yeah, and it's fun. Again, it's not punching down, nothing that'll get us in trouble. Um, but it's worked pretty well. Should you have social media if you're a production company? Yeah, because you can advertise the three things you're working on in your bio, but you can just have one photo on your Insta. You don't have to post, mm. but you can have a presence, right? But if you do post, what kind of stuff do you post? Yeah, so we, we just had this uh, little series about, yeah, people like behind the scenes and... Uh, this one here, Ems, she was the head of uh, makeup and wardrobe on uh, one of our shows. And it's just real straightforward. It's nothing tied directly to the show, but it's um, just really easy to sort of execute content that you can do consistently, I guess, like I've said before. So, What I like about what you do is how you, you really introduce what making TV looks like. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because I think that's the other thing is um, we really want to make it like something that's, I guess my personal, my personal goal is to make making television and film um, really accessible, especially to young Māori and PI, but young people in particular, because of my background, like I said before, I didn't come from knowing all of it. I just was really lucky to meet good people who showed me the way. And so I guess I built my company around that philosophy of we're going to show people how it can be done, how, how easy it is. You know, we, we'll probably do a series around how to get funding from NZ on air. Um, <laughs> we'll just be real good mates with Amy and... Um, <laughs> no. no, but just, just really break down the, you know, the barriers because the, the biggest barrier for, for a lot of people is, is knowledge and from knowledge comes confidence. So that's a big thing that we're tackling. And, and doing little things like this, it just kind of shows like how simple a lot of this stuff is. So, you know. I am racing to get through all the excitement that we've got to yeah. finish this up with, but there's a question I've got on my piece of paper and there's a question here that are the same. What are the numbers that matter? Engagement, reach, clicks, views, shares, quote tweets? For, for me, uh, so on, on Instagram, there's a, there's a tool that when you, um, you can basically see who's reshared your, to their story, your content to your story. That was the number one most important one yeah. uh, for me. I, I think the yeah. key thing always is to, and this is all marketing and publicity, you're, your whole thing is eyeballs on screen, right? So um, it is very show dependent as well. And it's quite, quite interesting, depending on the audience, you'll find that reach is bigger, you'll find that engagement is bigger. Engagement's pretty important to me because it shows that they're actively mm. in, invested in that. Um, but I think whatever you do within the social media realm and whatever you're aiming for, your goal is always to put eyeballs on that screen. Mm. And using whatever and you have to do. It. To do that. Like, for example, this Cremary watch party, we basically just called up mates. So Cremary was dropped on TVNZ On Demand, all of them at once. 
and then it was played out and broadcast weekly. We wanted to keep the hype going weekly, so each time it was broadcast, we'd do a watch party, and this was essentially... On Instagram? On, or? We actually, we did it either on Twitter or Instagram, and then we shared it on the... Like, it was whatever the person was comfortable with, so they would do a takeover, and they would react to watching it. And these were friends of ours that we basically did it. Friends with reach. Friends with reach. The, the, the watch party, the first watch party was quite curated. I really worked hard with the filmmakers as to what beats we were going to go through as the episode aired. TVNZ said, I'm allowed to say this, but with a huge caveat <laughs> that this is just anecdotal, and we don't know if this is because of the watch party, but there was a spike in on demand each time the show was broadcast when we were doing these watch parties. So we don't know if it was because of this. I like to think that there was that it was pretty successful, and it just kept it kept it fresh. I mean, we had something each week to talk about and something different. And you were also, of course, utilising their social media presence, utilising Chris's, James's, Brindley's, and Karen's. It was yeah. That's something that takes a lot of time. You could spend all day online talking to the people who are talking about you, or you could do what we do, which is every Friday we go post your last four watched. We usually take a still from a recent film where it's possible to put four movie posters in, and then they post their last four watched, and then we tell them what we think about it. So Cronenberg's latest, that person's rated it four and a half stars. There's a unit still from that film, Kristen leaning into Viggo's ear, whispering, at a half star. But that's how we manage our team's own mental health and workload and expectations around interacting with our community. And it lets our community know when we'll be online, which is also quite helpful. For, um, for two years, I replied to every single yeah. comment that was commented on one of my posts and replied to every single message. And because you've got to, again, incentivize your audience who are engaging with you, because as soon as you engage them, then you've just given them a reason to keep doing it. It's the expectation of Yeah. Them. You've really got to get somebody who's, you know, who, who's there devoted to doing that. And trust me, it'll be worth every, every mm. dollar. Yeah, it sounds really simple, but it's really worth it. It's awesome. Um, to, to finish up mm. with an anecdote of one of your proudest moments. This is my mic drop. This is your mic drop. Do I, we play the video? Nah, or, no, it's, I think it's too long. I can explain it. But one of the things that we were talking about is do you even have a social media present? Controversial question. Controversial question. Do you need social media? And I actually personally don't think everyone does. Um, I think it's very project dependent and what your goals are and your objectives. Sometimes your social media strategy could be have an in-person launch party and invite other people, social media ambassadors, and give them assets to promote your, your thing because there is no point in starting something in social unless you're going to do it well. So just Otherwise, have a hashtag, not even in the have account. a hashtag. Don't, you might not have anything. The uh, Mad Men obviously did have a um, social media channel. I was working in Australia at the time. The Breaker Upper is was released and they have an amazing Celine Dion tribute almost in there with uh, the song, It's All Coming Back to Me Now. I realised that Celine Dion was going to be there a week after release. Spoke to the head of social at, at Mad Men and I said, how about we just get a clip of the girls saying, come watch our movie while you're in the country. Like, we'll just book it in for you at this local cinema. They don't say we want to meet you, they just say that's what we want to do. I, that went out. I sat by my email and just sat there and sent that clip to every single person who could remotely be connected to Celine Dion. Like, honestly, it was to the point where I was like, where does she live? Like, it was, I found her personal publicist's email. I didn't know her. Someone else did. She, they just said, here's her email. I emailed her. She actually came back. She's like, this is great. I've sent it on to Celine. I was like, brilliant. I was on set for True History of the Kelly Graham, which uh, Russell Crowe was in mentioned it to him, he tweeted it out. And then the British media reported that Celine and Russell were dating. Yeah, and, and the Australian media, he came to set and he's like, they think we're dating. <laughs> and I was like, sorry, Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so people basically, what it was, it was kind of seen as this big social media campaign, but it was actually a hell of a lot of stuff behind the scenes to actually get that social media traction. My inbox was just like insane. And then I was at a party on a Saturday night and I got a call from the production assistant at Celine Dion's show saying Celine would love to meet the girls. And we flew them back from New Zealand and we all met Celine Dion. And so you flew them back so you had money and a budget somewhere yeah, to get it? Yeah, the, the lovely people at Mad Men <laughs> said, yes, okay. we, 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 we can do this, it'll be enough. And we just, the traction on the film was just, you could see it, we did better than the New Zealand box office. Sorry, Andrew. 
It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> no, we it was great. have to wrap up. Um, I asked what your favourite tools are. Giphy, Sprout is quite good for social media management. Um, and please, I've just got to wrap this up with a few notes about the Aotearoa Screen Publicists Collective initiative, and then I'm going to play us out with an Instagram video because you absolutely have to see it because Court and I are arguing over, I think it's good for the production. It doesn't name the production. We don't know what the production is. There's no hashtag. There's no account. Which is why it's not good. Which is why it's not good. And I'm like, it's created buzz. Anyway, um, as you've hopefully heard today, strategy, you need a social media person. Um, you need to think about it early. The Aotearoa Screen Publicists Collective has funding from New Zealand on Air's COVID Capability Fund to run a series of one-to-one -one coffee sessions. We'll match producers who are at or near the start of their production with a publicist or audience expert for a dedicated free consultation on how to make the biggest viewer impact with your story and how to budget and schedule for this impact. You can apply for one of the limited spots via our website or by walking around the corner and filling out the form at our booth right here this weekend. Um, please thank Joe Damon. Please thank Courtney Mayhew. And please thank Gemma Gracewood. The Big Screen Symposium 2022 is brought to you by Script to Screen. We are grateful to our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, AUT, Images and Sound, and Te Mangai Paho. Voiceover is by me, Anna Corbett, and music by Poddington Bear.